I got near the Mississippi River and closer to New Orleans who had big plantations. They fixed that. Uh, and so again, if you go to the Mississippi Official State Museum, uh, that constitution gets replaced in the 1890s for, for some reason. Uh, and the new constitution is way worse for people who are rich white dudes. And it's, that, was, that was a very awkward part of the Mississippi State Museum to walk through and ask questions about. Uh, because they were like, well, we just decided the constitution wasn't that great. It's like, oh, why not? And they were like, because reasons, right? Uh, and so uh, for a period of time, things got a little better. Uh, particularly in uh, parts of the South, there was actually African-American political participation. Uh, right? There was significant amounts of black voting. Uh, and you can see uh, this illustrated here in a couple of pictures. You can see uh, here is this one. This is the first vote. Uh, and so here you can see uh, there's no secret ballot in those days that that will come at the end of the 19th century. Uh, and when you vote, what they typically do is they have like lists of the candidates up. Uh, and you typically tend to do what's called voting the, the uh, slate or vote of the party line. And so uh, you go in and they say, okay, here's like your, you, they take your name, you, you strike your name off the roll when you, you come in to vote, they check you off that you're there, and they give you like a, like a token, right? And then you walk in and toss it in a, a, bo a, a bobble for the Republicans or the Democrats, right? Uh, and when you do that, it's assuming you're going to vote for every Republican or every Democrat, right? Senator, governor, state representative, dog catcher, whatever. Uh, and so here you can see, uh, here's the guy uh, who's uh, supervising it. By the way, Union Army guy, right? Notice he's wearing the uniform. Uh, and then you've got a bunch of African Americans lining up to vote. This guy's a little, little closer, a little rough, but he's got tools in his pocket, right? He's a working man. Uh, he's a working hard, honest man. Here, this guy's in a three-piece suit. Uh, he's a wealthy man of some substance and means. Uh, and then this guy here is a Union Army veteran. Uh, and so the idea is that these aren't people who are getting the right to vote, who have no, who haven't earned it, right? These are responsible, hardworking citizens who have as much right to vote as anybody else, right? I mean, have as much right to vote as, uh, as anybody. If, if a poor white man can vote, uh, then why not the first guy, right? Uh, he's got a trade. Why not the second guy? He's got money. Why not the third guy? He fought in the army, uh, as it turns out. Uh, and so, having said that. Uh, what else can you say? Uh, and again, it's, it's always inevitable to suggest uh, who's not pictured in the voting process. Obviously women, right? But again, remember there's, there are, there are they came in a while. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah, it came, came in a while, right? But there are reasons for that, yeah. Was that 1865? Uh, this would be, the first vote would be, the first national vote would have been like probably 1866, when they voted for like, uh, what year uh, was that? 66. Yeah, the, uh, this one, I don't know that this one is from, uh, this one is from Harper's Weekly, uh, but like the first major election, probably there would have been voting in the states for like state legislatures and stuff as part of the reconstruction process. Right. And then the first time uh, African Americans would have cast a vote at the federal level would have been probably 66 for state representatives, uh, House of Representatives and third of the Senate and that kind of stuff. Uh, and so as it turned out, as you might imagine, black people voted in large numbers, right? I mean, that was, that was a big deal. Uh, and so here you can see another one. This is uh, Friedman voting in New Orleans in 1867. Uh, again, note that they've got the, there's no secret ballot, right? There's no, you know, you, you go throw your, your token in the, in the correct thing. Uh, and so, but again, notice there's a bunch of guys hanging around and they don't look like particularly, I mean, these are a bunch of poor people who have no business being participating in the political process, if that's even what you would think, right? Uh, instead, everybody is, is sort of well-dressed, a bunch of guys in top hats, the, again, the inevitable guy wearing the Union Army hat, right? Uh, and because it's a crowd scene, always a dog, uh, right? I uh, remember World Stamp, always a dog, right? Uh, if you find people in the street, for whatever reason, they put a dog there. Uh, and so these governments actually did change things. And it's interesting when you look at uh, African-American political representation of the 21st century, for example, South Carolina has an African-American senator uh, today, is a Republican named Tim Scott. When Scott got elected two or three, Four years ago, I think this is 2016 or 2014, he got elected. Uh, and everybody's like, oh, this is the first African American senator South Carolina's had since Reconstruction. Since Reconstruction. What they mean is that there's this weird period in the 1870s where like a bunch of black people got into Congress and stuff, and then it, then it stopped. Then it stopped abruptly and didn't happen again, right? And so uh, that's the thing is in the 1870s, yeah, the, in the 1860s, yeah, there were black people in the Senate from South Carolina, from Mississippi, from Alabama, from Georgia, and then abruptly it, it ended. Right? And then all of a sudden it's sort of happening again for the first time, right? And then Tim Scott got elected and he was the first African American to represent South Carolina in the Senate in like hundred years. Yeah. Were the voting stations integrated? Uh yeah, they would have been. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, but you just go you just go vote and it would have been like the way we do it, where it's like in a you know neighborhood and they have like a polling place and you go through it, yeah. Uh, now of course the way housing worked, technically they would have been integrated in that like 
you know, we just say, okay, half of you guys vote over there and half of you guys vote over there, and it may very well be that like this particular polling place, nobody white lives here, right? Uh, but yeah, they, they would have been. Not that, as you might imagine, that would have been a source of some friction for Southern whites who weren't exactly thrilled about any of this, right? Uh, and this leads us to another point worth making. Uh, if you look at South Carolina, for example, in 1860, South Carolina is 60% black. 60% uh, of the people in the state are African American. And as you might imagine, if you say you cut it in half, right? I mean, so 40% is white and 60% black. So if you assume half of those numbers represent women who aren't going to vote, so it's 30 20, right? 30% uh, of the, uh, of, uh, the uh, population is black men, 20% is white men. Uh, well, if you give all of those men to vote, like you free all the black people who are slaves, you give them all the vote, who runs the state? Well, that 30% of black people, if they can uh, concentrate themselves in the, in the districts in the right way, there's no question that they would run the state. They would elect majority of the state legislature, they would elect the governor, uh, member of the state legislature elects the senators, and then they elect the house uh, representatives. Uh, and so everybody who is white understands exactly what's gonna happen. If you're a state like South Carolina, if you hand everybody the vote, all of a sudden the most important voting block in the state becomes black men. Uh, and understandably, uh, who are black people going to vote for after the Civil War? Which political party are they going to choose? Anyone have a guess? Republican. They're not going to vote for Democrats. They're going to vote for it. And why? What did the Republican Party ever do for you? Well, you may recall Abraham Lincoln, Father Abraham, who literally freed the slaves. And also, you may recall the Republican Party freeing the slaves, right? And so it's sort of a no-brainer, right? There's, there's no question. Uh, this is one of the reasons why the Democrats are viewed as a, as a sort of a, 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 a maybe a risk or a dead party in the, in the 1860s. I mean, no northerner who supported the Civil War is going to vote for Democrat, and some white southerners are going to vote for Democrats, but like, guess what? Their votes are now, in some cases, a total minority, right? Uh, and so it will be a while, but eventually uh, the uh, the black vote will come up for grabs in, in a way that did not fit. Uh, and so it turns out the, the Republicans are going, to, are going to try to get black votes with Abraham Lincoln really until about the mid-50s. Uh, and it'll work until about the mid-50s. Uh, and then, then you get a little bit of a, sort of like a what have you done for me lately kind of a thing, right? Like what, what, is, what has the Republican Party done uh, for African Americans in the past, say, you know, 90 some odd years, right? Uh, but that, that'll be something we'll talk about a little bit later, right? Uh, and so again, for, for a while, it looks like things might be different, right? There was this whole argument in the 1960s that this was this massive missed opportunity, right? There was a moment where maybe it didn't have to be the way that it was, right? Maybe white Southerners and black Southerners could go along together. Lincoln definitely had this opinion of Reconstruction that the main thing would be to do enough to make it sort of doable and then move on. You know, we got work to do, we got to rebuild the economy, people need to get back to work, and we got to get things going again. Uh, but it, it got sort of derailed, uh, as the argument goes. And the uh, the counter argument, of course, it was never going to work anyway, and it, it was not, something that wasn't going to work can't be derailed, right? It can't be ruined if it was already broken, right? Uh, but there's a pretty big backlash that starts during uh, Grant's term in particular, right? Uh, and what happens is white Southerners, particularly wealthy white Southerners, uh, they, they begin to protest Reconstruction as aggressively as they can. Uh, and so uh, the name often used to apply to these guys uh, is this word. In English, we call it uh, bourbon, but that's not what it is. It's a reference to the French Revolution, uh, right? Uh, it's a reference to the House of Bourbon, uh, the French kings before the French Revolution. Uh, and remember, if you know your French Revolution, uh, the French kings were stupid, didn't see this coming, and got their heads chopped off. And then after the revolution, they brought back the, the dead king's brothers, and they didn't get it any more than the brother had, right? Uh, and so the metaphor here is that these guys are so out of tune, out of touch, that they wanna, it's sort of like they wanna go back to before the French Revolution, they wanna go back to before the Civil War, right? And the, the conventional side, they call these guys uh, bourbon Democrats, right? But it's, it's technically it's bourbon, but we don't pronounce it that way. Uh, and so the idea is that these Democrats, they wanna go back to how it was before the Civil War, right? They wanna go back to how it was before the Civil War. And these are extremely, extremely conservative Democrats. Uh, the kind of guys who a few years ago would have been like pro-slavery, you know, would have been pro-secession. Well, that ship has sailed. You can't be pro-slavery and pro-secession anymore, but you can try to essentially uh, put the South in a deep freeze. What if we didn't change anything, right? Like, what if what if we freed the slaves, but like, you know, not really, right? What if we what if Reconstruction happened, but it was sort of like window dressing, right? Uh, you go home and you change your shirt, and you're still you. You're just wearing a different shirt, right? Uh, and this was the idea that these guys had. And the crucial thing that they had to do, which it turned out they did really well, was convince poor white people to be on their side. Right? There's this whole ongoing argument in the 19th century uh, that if you're a poor black person and I'm a poor white person, we actually have a lot in common, right? We get screwed over by rich people all the time, right? And 
other than the fact that I'm white and you're black, we're basically the same, right? Uh, the Bourbon Democrats have a counter argument to that, which is the most important thing about people is the color of their skin, right? You might be poor white and I might be a rich white guy, but we're basically the same, we're both white, right? We gotta stick together against the black guy, right? And the black guy is gonna come and if you do all sorts of terrible things to you, if you give him a chance, uh, and who's gonna help him do it? Well, the government, the Freedmen's Bureau, the army, the Republicans, they're all gonna empower the black guy, and the black guy's coming for you, right? Uh, and so what, what's the black guy gonna do? Uh, well, he, he might kill you because you're a former slave owner. Uh, he might do all sorts of other bad things. What's the probably the number one threat if you're a poor white person that a rich white guy will tell you a black guy is gonna do to you? What do what what scary people who aren't like us do to poor people all the time? What do immigrants do to poor people today? Take our jobs. Take their jobs. The black guy is going to come, he's going to take your job, because he's going to work it for 10% less, right? He's going to say, hey, I'm just as strong as that white guy. I'll work on your farm, pay me half of what you pay him. And the businessman, who ironically is the rich white guy is me, but like, you know, I don't talk about that. The businessman is going to say, oh, sure, whatever. I'll hire this guy over here. Bob over here is, is black, and I can pay him half what I pay you. So sorry, you know, thanks, but no thanks, right? And so that's the argument, and it works, as it turns out. Uh, and we're not particularly rational creatures. Economists love to talk about models of human behavior where people behave like the Terminator and are like robots and make these perfectly rational economic decisions all the time. Milton Friedman, uh, the economist, was a big proponent of what he called rational markets theory, which proposed that people made economic decisions for totally rational reasons, which if you know anything about people, is completely false. Because if you ever if you ever bought a car from a car salesman, the car salesman would tell you that people are fundamentally irrational, which is why he has a job, right? Uh, and so uh, the, the Bourbon Democrats, they got it, and they played on status anxiety and racial anxiety to essentially sell the idea that all, you know, when, when we were slaves, when the slaves were slaves, it was easy, right? It was, it was, we're free, they're not, we gotta stick together. We're the free dudes, right? They're the slaves, right? Now you've got more complicated, but it worked. They call it the solid South, all the white people solidly together um, against uh, against the free men, right? Uh, and it pretty much works, uh, as it turns out. That's the big project of the Bourbon Democrats in the 1870s and 80s, and, and just to make this happen, and it pretty much works. And so, and you can understand why. If you're a poor white person, and you do not have an education, you do not own property, you do not have a lot of money, you do not have anything, uh, but you have one thing going for you if you're this poor white guy. Uh, what's the one thing you have going for you? You're, you're not black. Right? Uh, I mean, I, as, as poor as I am, as dumb as I am, as illiterate as I am, I mean, I'm not that black guy over there, right? Uh, and that's that's a horrible thing to base a society around, but that's the that's the sort of the the lever, that's the sort of the wedge that the Bourbon Democrats use, right? They, they, and, they, and understandably, it was the same way under under slavery, right? As, as poor as you were, if you were a white guy, there was one thing that you had that the black guy didn't have, it was his freedom, right? I mean, at least you're not that guy, right? Uh, and so, uh, it, as it turns out, this is a very persuasive argument, right? The trick is, under Johnson, the uh, first, you know, things began to change. When Johnson was out, Grant came in, uh, you know, sort of maybe it would keep going. Maybe reconstruction would get better. Maybe these Bourbon Democrats are going to get swept aside. Right? The entire point of the name Bourbon Democrats is to tell you that the idea is that these guys are on the wrong side of history, right? These guys are these guys are the French kings, you know, whistling all the way to the guillotine kind of a thing. Uh, but it, unfortunately, it doesn't work uh, as it turns out. And there's a, a whole variety of reasons behind it, uh, but we can we can talk about it. Part of it is that. The Democrats discover a particularly persuasive series of arguments to make about Reconstruction in the 1870s, right? They talk about the fact that, hey, by 1870, Reconstruction's been going on almost as long as the Civil War was going on itself, right? Right, I mean, Re Reconstruction's been, been happening almost as long as the Civil War. How long are we gonna do this, right? Uh, and they also make, a, this is ironically, a fairly good argument. Uh, aren't the Southerners supposed to be citizens of the United States of America? And if that's true, you're occupying the South with the military, right? You're having these elections supervised by the U.S. Army, uh, so, you know, sort of not allowing the Southern states to kind of run their own affairs, uh, which is the way states are supposed to work, right? States are supposed to supervise their own elections and run their own business. Uh, and all those are really good arguments. How long is this going to happen? And of course, the counterpoint is, well, it's going to happen until you treat black people like humans. It's a pretty good argument. But that's, you know, the, even Northerners, uh, as you might imagine, are racist about this. I mean, even Northerners, sure, free the slaves, but I don't know, make black people equal to white people? That's a, that's a, that's asking a lot, right? And remember, the newspaper that I put up uh, attacking the previous group, that's from Pennsylvania. I mean, this isn't from like Mississippi or something. This is a caricature of a black guy that appeared uh, in Pennsylvania. Uh, and so the argument that the Freedmen's Bureau is essentially taxpayer subsidized giveaways uh, for black people, uh, that's a very persuasive argument, right? You're a northern guy, you're paying your taxes, the money's going into the south, and it's not doing anything useful, right? Uh, and so there's the sense by the 1870s that like, when is this gonna end, right? When are we gonna get over this? In 
there is a depression. Uh, there's a it's, a, it's a recession that turns into a depression. Uh, the Wall Street stock market collapses. Uh, as it turns out, Jay Cook and company is a, a, a financial house. They try to corner the market.